Padre, se fede in et spiritu sancti. Amen. The blessed feast of St. John Vianney to everyone, and also a wish a happy and blessed graduation to those high school seniors who are here. And so we're going to get a double sermon today. I will speak about St. John Vianney and then something about graduation. And I'm going to tie them together. I don't know how yet, but I'm going to do it. Uh, St. John Vianney, a pastor of Ars, France, confessor, miracle worker, patron saint of parish priests, uh, one of just the, the, the um, uh, one of those great, uh, greatest of saints. In fact, he would be told at one time he would um, struggle with the devil, it would appear to him. The devil told him if there were three such priests as yourself, the entire world would be converted. I'm not doing my job, obviously. Okay. Uh, so he was born in 1786, right, three years before the French Revolution, and as a young child, he experienced firsthand the religious persecution of the church. Uh, he was taught his catechism by two nuns who had had to flee their convent. Uh, they weren't even, they were, they were, they were these nuns on the run, as they say, they were in hiding. That's how he learned his catechism. He received the sacrament of confirmation in secret by a priest who was hiding, going from house to house. Uh, this shaped the mind and heart of young John Vianney very much, and he began to see religious as heroes for Christ, which indeed they were. So this, this is what formed him from the beginning, and he began studying for the priesthood in secret, of course. And as he was studying, and he wasn't a very good student, for, for, for you high school grads here, he graduated when he was 29. So there's a lot of times homeschoolers, they end up graduating late. Oh, I was 19 when I graduated, I was 20. St. John Vianney was 29, so don't worry about it. But he began studying for the priesthood. Um, <clears throat> but part of what delayed him was he was drafted into Napoleon Bonaparte's army. And this was to fight, of course. This is actually an interesting uh, historical side note. Uh, this is one of the bloodiest wars, was Napoleon Bonaparte. Up to that time in France, well, aside from the religious wars in the 1600s, uh, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte was the first one to use conscription, mass conscription. Didn't matter if you wanted to or not, he was going to uh, draft you into the army. Like the, one of the first historical uses of the draft, St. John Vianney got tagged. And uh, you had no choice. You had to go. So this is where God uses our weaknesses to his and our advantage. Uh, because St. John Vianney, um, you know, God bless his heart, he was not very organized, or um, I think they would diagnose him as ADD or something like that these days. Um, he got lost on the way. He was supposed to go from his town to the recruiting station. He got lost. He, he, couldn't, he couldn't find out where he was. Um, he, he, it, it, like, it started to rain on him. He was in the wrong town. He got sick. Uh, so he, 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 missed, he, he missed a boat already. He was already. By the time he found out like, where he was, it had been a week. He was already would be classified as a deserter. If he showed up for, for duty, they, they could have prosecuted him and put him in jail. So he's, he just, and you see, he'd known. He, this was not a good army. He grew up with the persecution of the church. So he did what his example was. That priest who gave him confirmation, those nuns, he went into hiding. He hid with some local families and um, he started teaching what little he knew, teaching grade schoolers. Um, and he did that for about a year, and then by then, uh, that, by that point, I think uh, Napoleon, um, it, it had passed, um, the conscription was over with, and so he returned home and uh, resumed his studies. Uh, and it, like I said, he was not very good. At one point, I think it was in class, he's this, you know, huge, you know, 27, 28-year-old man, and he's in class with 15-year-old uh, young boys. And some of them, the 15-year-olds, were assigned to help teach John Vianney remedial lessons. So he was, he, was having, he was getting lessons from people almost 15 years younger than he was. Uh, but he was very humble about it. One of the, one of the young boys, this bratty little French boy, um, got so mad he like slapped him in the face. And St. John Vianney just had tears running down his cheeks. He was just like, I'm sorry for being such a bad student. Uh, so great, great humility from uh, the Curie of ours. <clears throat> So he's finally ordained a priest at the age of 29, and he was as an assistant pastor for three years before being given his assignment in Ars, France, where he spent the, le the rest of his life. Uh, now, because of the French Revolution, because of the uh, Napoleonic Wars, uh, the French towns were just in shambles. Uh, there was, in Ars, there was one church and zero pastors. They hadn't had a priest for years. People hadn't been to confession in years. They hadn't been to mass in years. Uh, and so this is where St. John Vianney went. And, it, you know, these days, 
I mean, no, I mean, yeah, it's bad. Um, uh, the masses have been canceled, confession times have been restricted, and so on, uh, but at least we still have them, right? It's good for us to remember in the past, our fellow Catholics, things have been much worse. Uh, so it's no, no, no excuse, but, but um, we should look, look and think, okay, finally, um, finally it's our turn. It's our turn uh, nowadays to experience something of what it's been like for Catholics in the past. Uh, so these, these poor people, um, uh, no mass, no confessions, uh, but they didn't deal with it well. They did not deal with it well. They, they did not rejoice when the Kirivars came back. It's like, oh, we have our mass back. They were drinking. They were gambling. Um, it, it's been said that if they knew one thing about God, it was about how to take his name in vain. Uh, so very, very bad way of life for, the, uh, uh, for these people. They were living like pagans. They were not observing the Sunday, uh, the Sabbath rest. They were working in the fields on Sunday. And instead of going to church, they went to the local tavern. Uh, which, as we may know, was, was infamous for its, its uh, drinking, gambling, and dancing. This is one of the first things the cure of ours did when he went into town, uh, is he put the axe on dancing. And we'll see more about that later. <clears throat> uh, but St. John Marie Vianney, if he wasn't uh, intellectually or, or academically gifted, uh, he was uh, very gifted as, we could say, uh, the talent for perseverance and fortitude. So he set to work, and he spent 18 hours a day for the rest of his life helping to reform other people's lives. 18 hours a day. So that's, that's six hours uh, he set aside to sleep, which he, which he didn't get very much at all. So his life was incredible. He would get up at 2 a.m. 2 a.m. is when he would get up. He would read his breviary, do his mental prayer, and then he would go into the confessional around 3 or 4 a.m. Towards dawn, he would prepare for mass, make his Thanksgiving after mass, and then go back into the confessional. Around 11 a.m., he would leave the confessional, have a glass of milk for breakfast and lunch, and check up, he's, and check up on the orphanage he had started there in town. Uh, and then he would talk to the orphanage leader there. He had a couple of women helping him out, see a few of his parishioners. Then he would pray some more, uh, take care of business, and then go back into the confessional at 2 p.m. And then all through the rest of the afternoon, he would hear confessions. Then he would stop for dinner, which was a potato. And then he would say more prayers, do some more business, and then back into the confessional until 10 p.m. And then he would go to his room for the night. He would say his night prayers and finish the day around 11 p.m. or midnight, and then get up the next day at 2. In uh, the cause for his canonization, it says that um, for the majority of his life, the Curie of Ars would survive on food and sleep insufficient to sustain human life. Which is, which, is, which is the case. This is not possible. Uh, people will start to go crazy with a diet like that and with a sleep cycle like that. And here's part of the trouble, right? You don't will yourself into this. You respond. God gives you grace and you respond to it. The Curie of Ars was able to do this uh, because it was, it was a, a supernatural gift. And I, I, actually it's happened. Uh, I've, seen it, I've seen other priests who try to force themselves into this. They read this life, they're zealous, they want to be um, um, a good priest, they want to be like the Curie of Ars. He's the patron saint of, of parish priests. And so they try to sleep like this and eat like this, and they end up going a little bit crazy. Uh, they ruin their health, they have to be taken out of ministry because this is not something that we, that we human beings can do. And we get this mistake. This is like the American, um, uh, what do they call that? Uh, meritocracy idea. If you really want something, you can do it. Just set your mind to it and you can accomplish anything. Well, I want to be a saint like the Curie of ours. Guess what? He didn't set his mind to that. God gave it to him. And if we think we can, we can reach out and grab sanctity or climb up that mountain and I'm going to achieve it and conquer the mountain of sanctity, uh, you will always fail. Because that's the wrong, wrong, wrong idea. God gives it. You have to wait. So, um, so that was his life. And even when uh, the care of ours would try to sleep, he'd be tormented by the devil. He would make noises in his room, like tearing bed sheets or rats. And the care of ours, he'd get out and look, and he wouldn't see anything. And he'd get back in and hear the rats scurrying. He'd get out. It was the devil, right, trying to, trying to mess with him. Sometimes he would hear the devil's voice cursing him. And one time he was actually physically assaulted by the devil. The devil threw him out of bed. Um, and he would hear voices, howling, noises, shouting, evil singing, and so on. Uh, oh, it? One, one night, uh, the devil set his bed on fire. Uh, it's a little, you know, that, um, it was a hot flash, I don't know, maybe something like that. 
Uh, but the saint became used to these attacks. He shrugged them off. At, at one point, he said, the devil and I have become so used to each other, we're almost pals. Uh, but the, um, so the men in the village, when, when this first started happening, uh, when the Kiravars was talking about this, they thought that it was some young uh, ruffians, like, making trouble. So they were gonna, they had assigned an armed man to stay in house for the night. And he, he was fine for a few nights until the man with John Vianney heard the demonic activity and he bolted and left, just like immediately, boom, ran out of the house, just absolute in terror. Uh, so you may think that this was, um, <clears throat> that the people would have, would have recognized they had a saint in their town, uh, but, but not, not at all, right? Very many of them were upset that the Kiri of Ars was, was upsetting their comfortable way of life. As I mentioned, the, the drinking, the dancing, the gambling, he would give very many sermons against all of these excesses. Um, but it was because, you know, every priest when he goes to his parish has to focus on what are my problems here in this parish. And that tavern was the source of pretty much all the evil in his people's lives. If it wasn't for that tavern, they wouldn't be tempted. They wouldn't be getting all this evil. So that's why he attacked it. And what did he attack? He attacked drinking, gambling, and dancing. And none of those th three things are wrong intrinsically, only when done to excess. And that's what the Kiravars attacked, is they attacked them to, because of their excess. And again, I mentioned those, those overzealous priests, you have, you have a, a few of them, uh, likewise with the Kiravars, um, going overboard, trying to be like him exactly, and they'll try to attack dancing, specifically, exclusively, and it, it just, it's a, it's a bit of an excess. Uh, so um, he was accused, he was criticized, um, he was made fun of by other priests as being a pretender, uh, one woman accused him of being the father of her child. At one point, a petition went around to remove him as pastor. And when a loyal parishioner got wind of it, he indignantly seized the petition and brought it to St. John Vianney and said, these people, they're, they're signing a petition to get you removed as pastor. And so John Vianney took the petition and he signed it himself. <laughs> he was actually, always, he was trying to leave. He tried to leave at ours four times. He said he needed to leave um, and go to join a monastery where he could weep for his sins and his wicked way of life. In fact, one time, uh, he asked God to give him the grace to see himself as God saw him, and he prayed earnestly for this grace, and God granted it to him. And uh, be careful what you wish for, because you may get it, and he did. And when St. John Vianney saw himself as God saw him, he was so disgusted and nauseated, he begged God to let him forget. That kind of frightens me, but uh, because it, this, is, this is in well into his life of of, of praying and, and and even working miracles, uh, which which was the case. People would he would work healing miracles, and uh, um, people would ask him to, to come, and uh, he would go there, and he would he would say he would pray to Saint Philomena, and she would heal them, and um, he would blame her for his miracles. Uh, at one point, he, he, he was not, wasn't paying attention. He was like, well, let's pray to St. Philomena. And somebody grabbed his hand and put it on the sick person, and they were healed immediately before he could pray. So his, like, cover was blown. Uh, but he, um, he called her the Wonder Worker. And um, m many people are familiar with the, um, the Living Rosary. started with, like, the St. Philomena devotion. You pray one, one decade a day. He's, he's responsible for that. He started the, the Living Rosary. Every person says one decade of the 15 decades of the Rosary, and together they all... Uh, um, are praying all these extra rosaries throughout the day um, uh, together united um, maybe I should I don't know cut this short I could go on I read this huge book of St. John Vianney before I entered the seminary it was one of one of my saint books and a very very good book for any young man wanting to enter the priesthood I would encourage you to read that book it's like the big thick one on John Vianney um, he was extremely polite. Uh, he was a, a, a peasant by birth, and as I mentioned, not well educated, wasn't educated in either uh, letters, grammar, or, or courtesy, but the nobility who would come to hear his, um, go to confession to him thought he'd been educated as a noble because he was so courteous. And that is what sanctity does, is sanctity is actually where the French nobility, the, the uh, um, European aristocracy, that's where they got their... Um, manners from was out of the Benedictine monasteries because everybody treats um, uh, those who are above them in rank as Christ. Treat others as you would treat Christ. And, that, and so when you do that, when you have that idea and attitude, you're always thinking of others. And if this was Christ, what would I do? Courtesy comes natural. It's easy to be courteous when you're thinking that way. 
And that is where that high society came out of. It was supposed to ennoble people and make them more generous and courteous. Uh, and then we see that was the case for St. John uh, Vianney. Uh, however, he was not nice. Right? There's a difference between being courteous and being nice. Nice guys are wimps, right? Uh, courageous men, virtuous men, they, they are strong. So this one uh, fop from Paris um, uh, comes in. He, he, he imagines himself to be um, knowledgeable in spiritual affairs, and he's, he's a nobility, so he, he's used to people be deferring to him. And he catches sight of the curie of ours in a, a crowd of people, and he says, oh, I've come down here to have a spiritual conversation with you. Uh, the curie of ours looks at him and instantly, you know, can see uh, who he is. And the, he says, the curie of ours in front of everybody, he says, you, sir, a spiritual conversation? You are an ignoramus. And he went on, just completely dismissed him. So it wasn't like he was afraid or you know, unable to call people out when he had to. That is the mark of virtue, is that you are un, uh, uh, unfailingly polite and kind to everyone, but when required, uh, can be very, um, uh, very strong, very firm. And even if people need it, uh, you can give them a little dose of humility uh, when, they, when they put themselves up falsely. Um, so he would, he would continue this for uh, uh, many, many years, nearly, nearly um, uh, 60 years, and he would die finally in the year 1859 on August 4th after having uh, given his entire life to God. And, um, uh, you know, as, as, a, as a young man, he got very sick when he was within, I think, one year, a few first years of his priesthood. He was, he was near the point of death. And he begged God to give him life, and he said, um, I, uh, am I to come to you empty-handed? What he meant was souls. He wanted to bring God a great uh, um, number of souls when he himself went to heaven. And so he recovered from his illness and then spent his whole priesthood doing precisely that, bringing souls to God. Uh, and so, you know, I would like to transition now into the graduation sermon because death is graduation from life. And we could say the, the Curie of ours graduated from this life into heaven, and what was his grade, right? Um, I remember as, as a young man being in college, or, um, or even being in, in, in earlier, and high school, graduating high school, that was forever. That day was just, it was like five years away. I wasn't even in high school yet. I just didn't even think about it. It was so far away. And that day finally came, and it's way past. And it's like, oh, graduating from college, wow, that day will never come. That's so far. It came and it went, and it's way past. Uh, and then I went to the seminary, and that was seven years long. And I joined, I remember my first summer. I'm thinking, wow, seven years in this place, it's gonna be forever before I'm a priest. And it's come and it's not so far away. It's been six years already. Uh, and now I'm thinking, think about the end of your life. That's so far away. One day, that is going to come and be long gone. And what will we wish we had, would have done? Uh, that is exactly how we should be thinking all throughout our lives. And I can remember, too, a young man uh, who, before he joined the priesthood, uh, had a job. And he, he used to say he didn't go to work. He went to stress. He was so stressful at work. That's what he went to every day. And he hated it. He hated his job. And he said, you know, every day there are people, they get up, and they can't wait to get to work. They love their job. I'm not one of those people. And so he prayed that, that um, uh, God would, would give him uh, a job where he loved to go. He loved it, loved doing it. And he was thinking, what kind of a job would I like to do? And this young man was, was uh, um, uh, kind of uh, discovering the, the, the Catholic Church, discovering tr traditionalism. And he wanted, he's like, I would, if I could have my dream job, I'd be paid to go to the library and read. Um, God said to him, or he was like, you got this idea. You are in school right now. You are in a library. You're in a library of virtue. You're in a library of leadership. You're learning how to manage at work. You're learning how to manage stress. You're learning how to manage patience. You can read about patience all you want. This is your practical application. You can read about courage all you want. Here's your practical application. So that young man changed. He's like, I'm not going to stress. I'm going to school. And every day he went into work and he looked for opportunities to learn to learn leadership, to learn about uh, courage, to learn about all these different things. Uh, later on, that young man went to the priesthood, and guess what he got? He, 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 um, he'd been in the military. He got the GI Bill, and they paid him to go to the library and learn exactly what he wanted. 
Uh, so what's the lesson there? In this life, what do you wish you could do? Think about your, your dream job or what would you love to do and think about God will bring that to you. And every day you think, I wake up and my life is stressful and, you know, uh, I've got this to do, that to do. Uh, this is school. This is your school. School will never end. I'm sorry, high school graduates. Whether you're going off to college or not, you are going to study for the rest of your lives. Whether you're studying academics or virtue, this is your opportunity to learn what is going to be your grade on charity, what's going to be your grade on patience, what's going to be your grade on uh, love of God, on piety, on prayer. Right? That is how we should be thinking about it. And it's not a burden. It's something I have to get over with or get through so I can get on with my life. This is our life is preparing for heaven. That is exactly why we were sent here on earth. And we should think about that. That is number one in our lives. Am I learning the lessons that God is setting before me? Am I passing this grade in my life of dealing with stress, of dealing with tragedy, of dealing, dealing with difficulty, or whatever it may be? And I, I hate to say this, right? If you fail a grade, um, you, 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 don't, you don't get a, a free pass. God is going to bring you over and over again. He's going to bring you that class. This is the material on patience you need to learn. And if you don't learn it, if you don't pass the grade, you're going to learn it over and over and over and over again. This is what people, happens to people that get divorced and remarried like five times. They get to that point in their marriage where they need to learn something and they don't learn it. And they just think it's easy. I'm going to get divorced. And they go off and they marry somebody else. And guess where they get to? That same point. They get divorced and they do it over and over again. Uh, that was, that was a, um, a book on marriage, failed marriages or uh, redeeming impossible marriages or something like that. And those couples that worked it through all reported, 90% of them, they were, they were so much happier having stayed in their difficult marriage and worked it out. That's one of the, one, just one of the myriad of lessons. Somebody who, they are not good at finances, they're not good at discipline, they're not good at patience, they're not good at anger, that whatever it is, it's a lesson God wants to teach you. Uh, so for those uh, graduating students, uh, I want to, to let you know you're graduating from childhood, coming up into adulthood, and adulthood is about growing up, not just physically, not just intellectually, but morally. Virtue, now it's your chance to be more like an adult, which is thinking less about self and more about others, uh, less about this world, more about the next world. And uh, that's a lesson that I think all of us could serve to remember uh, pretty much every year of our lives. Uh, so let's take that to heart. Uh, let us uh, ask for the intercession of St. John Vianney uh, for our graduating uh, seniors uh, here at Mass, that he may fill them with his spirit uh, of maturity, of a love for God, of, of going to God uh, with hands full of souls, full of virtues, and let him, us ask him to pray for us as well, that we might remember uh, those lessons we either have learned and have forgotten or never learned to begin with in our lives. Uh, may we, like St. John Vianney, even though, though he might be a bad student, uh, be humble and accept correction from God or even from those uh, younger than us. So when we, the, this uh, life ends, uh, we may graduate uh, with not just a passing score, right, but, but the perfect score that God wants us to have. God bless you all.